Hello and welcome to the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. I'm Sama Morningstar and I have Tiffany Taff with me, Dr. Tiffany Taff, I should say. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Tiffany. Um, I would love for you to introduce yourself a little bit more, sharing about your work, let us know, uh, and, and what womb centered healing means to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Tiffany Taft, and I am an integrative health and wellness therapist. Um, by that, I mean I include several different modes um, of healing from the healing arts to include massage, yoga, uh, aromatherapy, reflexology. I'm also a birth and postpartum doula and a childbirth educator. And I utilize all of those um, or components of each of those um, services to customize services for my clients. Um, I am uh, currently located in the Northern Virginia area. And so I um, am planning actually to expand because a lot of my services don't require me to be at one specific location. Um, and so I am looking to connect with like-minded um, practitioners that are um, my focus moving forward will be more so maternal fetal health. And that's really where I'm um, headed with my services mm -hmm. uh, and main focus. Mm -hmm. And so I started out in, out in the healing arts in 2004. Um, although I have been traditionally medically trained um, for well over 20 plus years. Um, and so my practice really is centered around East meets West um, because I believe in evidence-based medicine but I also believe that there's a holistic way to take care and heal the body. Um, what does womb-centered heal, womb healing mean to me? Well, for me, the womb is a sacred place, um, especially for women, we are a portal. So we receive, and so our ability to um, protect our womb and make sure that it is in the most optimal and, and healed state, we must constantly um, protect our space and connect ourselves with things that are truly in line, in alignment and intentful for what is for our greater good. Wow. So I'm imagining that in your holistic healing practice that you do quite a bit of education potentially around that the womb being a sacred space and how do we um bring it to you know optimum health and well-being and how that affects our whole health and well-being um as a womb-centered healing practitioner myself i feel like the womb is at the center of our whole overall holistic wellness and that if our womb is ailing in any way for example you know common womb ailments that many people accept as normal like painful menstruation or difficulty conceiving or even more severe things like endometriosis or um, the list goes on that <laughs> that those <laughs> are a sign of our overall health and well-being needing attention, um, which is somewhat contrary to what a lot of um, more medically oriented practitioners, which a lot of medical research, which I'm sure you learned in your training, was based on the male norm, the masculine mm -hmm. body as the norm, right? And just didn't even really include the feminine body. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the, the womb is sort of an afterthought or something added on later as opposed to what it really is, which is, guess what? The source of all life, right? <laughs> Where we all started. So I wonder, could you share a little bit about how you, um, you know some of the key points that you bring when you're when you're working with a new uh, healing client that these ideas might be new to and that those you know those old ideas of the womb being something to be ignored are still sort of there in the person yeah so I do have a um, 
I'll say a mixed client base. So I do see male clients um, as well. Um, but more so from the perspective of chronic pain and rehab, that's in general for everybody, right? So I am focused on um, their physical healing, uh, not only their physical healing, I should say, but also mind and spirit. And so from those conversations, I really kind of in my consultation or my intake, really try to understand why is it that they have selected um, massage or yoga practice? What are they looking to obtain from that? And how best can I um, help serve for the physical pain for which they present to my table for? Um, so it really just depends on you know, what questions and, and responses I get from those questions um, that the clients have. For my female clients, specifically my prenatal clients um, or my postpartum clients, um, the questions are um, can go a little bit more deep, right? Because it's a more um, higher feminine connection. They are birthing or have birthed a whole other person or, or people if it was multiples. And so um, usually in that prenatal visit, I'm asking them, what is the birth story that you wish to tell for you and your, your baby? And how do you see that playing out? What are the things that we need to plan for to make sure that I can be the best advocate for that mom? Because that's what I essentially I am as a doula. Mm -hmm. I don't replace her family or her partner or her husband. Um, I am simply an extension of them. And so my questions and my intent are to be there to serve her and make sure that we're all on the same page when um, the day of her, the baby's birthday is, it's time, it's go time. So I am there to be her mind, body, spirit, to help her keep focused. Um, because it may, she may be in for the long haul with this birth or it could be short lived, but whatever it is, it's a journey and it's her journey. And I want to make sure she has the best experience possible mm -hmm. for some women. Um, they may be, may have had the experience of a sexual trauma, um, or, uh, just a, a sexual assault. And, and either one of those could have a completely different outcome, um, in terms of what her journey or her personal birth story may be. And so, um, being sensitive and mindful of that situation and, and, kind of preparing her, I guess, emotionally and mentally as much as possible before it's time to give birth. Right. And so do you mostly attend births? I mean, I imagine you attend births anywhere that the mother ends up having her birth. I imagine you've attended home births, hospital births, all different uh, kinds of birth scenarios, whether planned that way or evolving in that, in, in wherever it landed. Mm -hmm. I'm curious specifically for those um, moms who do have a history of sexual abuse or assault, what specific preparations or jobs do you take on to ensure, say, if that mom is being exposed to uh, health practitioners, medical providers, for example, that are new or unfamiliar to her, if the birth plan had to change or whatever, do you, I wonder if you could give some examples of how you advocate for that, for the sensitivity of those moms to be tended to in, in as we know, birth can, can be um, quite an unpredictable uh, story that unfolds. Yeah. So um, as much as possible, the, the prep is done um, ahead of time. And again, depending on where she is in her, her healing journey, um, because some women, you know, the trauma has happened, but they've never really openly discussed it. And so I use the opportunity not only in the intake, but as we progress through her pregnancy to um, not keep reminding her or having her relive it, but ensuring that she is um, hopefully be going to talk to a professional that's going to be able to help her start to work on the parts that she needs to heal for her for herself mm -hmm. um i am of the belief if she's already pregnant but has not yet healed from that trauma that the baby is now marinating in that that um sacred scared uh frustrated angry 
um, it's not as peaceful of a place as it should be because mom is not healed. And so um, we honor where she is and we try to get her resources if necessary um, in, in the form of uh, you know, psychologists or psychiatrists. We're also working with um, her OB doctor or her midwife who may or may not be aware of the situation, but that's something that we want to we have the conversation together if she likes. Um, mm -hmm. if, if we're not together, I definitely encourage her to have that conversation. This is not a time for mom to be hiding behind the shame. Everyone needs to be aware. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Beautiful. And so I've, I've heard many stories from other doulas and even uh, I even, um, was in contact with someone who was a lawyer and became a lawyer doula, like <laughs> that was keenly aware of mother's legal rights in the medical system, especially around body sovereignty and uh, express permission or, or not giving permission for various treatments for boundaries around the body and requests for, you know, uh, practice, medical practitioners being respectful of the female body when it's very easy, of the, of the birthing woman's body, when it's very easy for those practitioners to get into a very mechanical, this is our procedure, we're just going to come in and do this. Have you found yourself it, as a doula with those types of sensitive moms taking, uh, needing to intervene or have discussions with the new nurse on the ward that you haven't met yet or who you know is coming at this in an insensitive way um to you know take them out in the hall and say hold on here you know this is what my client my client's rights are and this is what she's requested and what she needs to have a healthy birth I, i'm curious to hear if you've had some circumstances like that that you've dealt with um fortunately no not yet um oh. i have not um, probably the extent to that is, is like you said, meeting the new nurse or um, being at a hospital where uh, the doula is not well received in uh -huh. the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a conversation to say, which is another reason why, you know, if I'm co-located where mom is, um, I ask if I could potentially meet her OB or her midwife ahead of time. Mm -hmm. and actually visit the hospital or the birthing center where she's going to be. Mm -hmm. So it's not the very first time on that day when everyone sure. is seeing me or seeing my face. Now, mm -hmm. having said that, nursing staff changes on mm -hmm. shifts, right? So I'm not going to be able to meet every nurse, but at least um, the conversation has been had with the two most important people that are going to be in the room, whether it's her OB or that midway. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so you come prepared with, I'm going to, might need to have a conversation before the care even begins as we're in the early process and you yeah. come in and you say okay who's the nurse who's going to be when's the shift change when am i going to look for a new nurse and so it sounds like you are heightened to you the whole situation your awareness and you catch it before it turns into a, an issue yeah and i usually just try to walk in and introduce myself and i don't even i'm not you know push push it pushy or aggressive about it. Um, but I do want, want to let them know because I am going to be there while she's birthing. So short of them actually physically kicking me out of the hospital, everyone on that shift, I ask the nurse that I speak to, please let them know, you know, that I'm going to, I'm here birthing with her. I'm her coach also. So, um, fortunately I haven't really had any issues and I think part of it helps that I am used to working in a hospital and set mm -hmm. up a setting. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a bit more comfortable and I kind of know when and how to navigate some of those systems. But there are facilities that just, we are not welcome. We're oh, in interesting. You're yeah. in the way, They're, you're even in the way. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's getting better, um, it really is. But there's a lot of work still to be done around the education of what our role is and how helpful we really are to that mom and those families. Is there, are there any kinds of um, projects that you know of, of educating medical staff about doulas? 
Not personally, no, but I have actually thought about inco incorporating some of that into some of my future projects um, mm -hmm. because, you know, specifically, I, so I'm currently uh, on the East Coast, but up north, and I'm planning to migrate at some point south. And so I really don't know, you know, what is the mentality there? Do they even know or have they even heard about what a doula is? Mm -hmm. um, how traditional are they in that birthing experience? And so some of that is going to be um, new education for me. And I'm hoping, you know, to be able to put together programs that will, um, or center even, that that piece of the puzzle is a part of the education of the the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from that, I would hope to invite, you know, the local hospitals or the birthing centers, you know, the midwives, all of that. So it's a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Right? Um, and not just, you know, me popping up at their hospital or their birthing center one day um, or some random, you know, person finding me as a doula. They know what I'm about, but we go to have the conversation and now everything stops because they're like, well, who is this person? Right, right. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your your dreams of this um, educational, collaborative educational process around doulas and, and medical staff, it sounds very similar to one that I've dreamed of, um, having gone to various gynecological practitioners with varying, uh, usually fairly low, awareness of the quality of touch that as massage therapists, you're one, I'm one, we is a highly developed keen sense of the effect that your touch has mm -hmm. on a person's body, which mm -hmm. very few medical practitioners that are touching bodies have had any training on. So my, one of my dreams is to have a compassionate touch for medical practitioners courses to offer because especially for gynecological you know I mean I've had gynecological visits where I feel like the person is just trying to get in and out there as quickly as possible and get it over with because it's really unpleasant to them yeah <laughs> I mean how <laughs> another most intimate moment of a woman's life <laughs> you know and here we're being treated that way you know instead yeah. of the honoring of this uh, sacred portal mm -hmm. of life yeah. that, it, that it could be right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so I wonder what I'm curious as to what was your original medical training and what your process was of saying you know what I need to move in this more holistic di uh, direction in your work yeah so I come um, from the nursing from a nursing um, background and mm -hmm. so I have worked um, OBGYN floors um, from a clinical perspective mm -hmm. there. Um, but over the years, I think I really, the more I, when I started out in massage therapy um, and the aroma therapy and Reiki, the energy work that I really found. And then for me personally, I guess it, it just came to a point where I said, there has to be a better way mm -hmm. to handle the body with love and care and allow it to heal itself without constantly dumping medication into it and, um, and or surgery to fix stuff. A lot of the stuff that we have could be prevent, prevented um, with the knowledge, right? We just, we're hard on the body and we feel like there's a pill or surgery, a knife that can fix everything. And some things just shouldn't even ever occur if we just take care of the body. So be more pre preventative um, with our care instead of reactive when mm -hmm. just waiting for it to happen. Um, so I even thought about osteopathic medicine because that doctor actually is that holistic do doctor. They are medically trained, um, but they at all costs try to heal that body as holistically first without the drugs and the mm -hmm. surgery where possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or even a naturopathic doctor that mm -hmm. brings in all of these uh, ancient yes. practices oftentimes. Mm -hmm. You know, massage therapy uh, 
predates all modern medicine. And in fact, in ancient China, the first medical practitioners that people went to for healing were touch therapists. They would put their hand on the hara, which yeah. is where the womb is, mm -hmm. and, and could diagnose and treat any illness in the body just by placing the hand on the hara. Yeah. And so yeah. That, that's the origin of massage therapy was the ancient medical uh, medicine people. Yeah. Um, and so reweaving these holistic methods into our reality seems to be uh, the work of the times uh, mm -hmm. as far as overall health and well-being yeah. for, for, our, for our species and for the planet. Um, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so what was the first thing you started to study uh, from being a nurse and saying there's got to be a better way? What did you start to look into first? Ooh, um, I think it really just was um, understanding the nursing environment as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually have my nursing degree. I got my nursing experience from the military. Uh -huh. so that is something that now um, as I've you know, progressed through my journey, because I thought about osteopathic school and I said, oh, I don't know. I want to do all that. But with this stage in my life, I don't know if I want to commit to that level of education in terms of time. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely love school and, and medicine and, um, overall. But at this point in my journey, I'm looking for ways I can be most impactful now uh, without spending that time in school and not being able to serve my community. So right. I probably will be taking um, that shorter route in investigating um, nursing school and specifically either um, midwifery or a nurse practitioner program. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's a shorter route, but it still allows me to do all of the things that I foresee myself um, doing in terms of my next level uh, programs and projects I'm looking to deliver. Sure. So, yeah, I am um, a PhD doctor, so mm -hmm. I'm focused on, while I have done the hands-on clinical piece, I'm really now into asking the questions why mm -hmm. and understanding the research and how I can make a difference there, especially from a perspective of education, because there's so many people that just don't have the correct information or any information at all. Wow. So what did you get your PhD in? It's what was your so thesis? Not in health and wellness. Oh no. <laughs> what was your what was your thesis about? So I did manage to weave the healthcare piece in there. So my I am a cybersecurity um, professional in terms of my degree. Mm -hmm. um, but I did from a from a lens of leadership in the healthcare environment. So how to protect um, the resources and what types of leaders um, would you typically find in a healthcare environment when you add on the t on top of that um, cybersecurity, which we know can be a very costly um, expense, especially in healthcare. And that's the one area where you cannot afford your information to be compromised. Yeah. Um, so much more to lose. And not just your information, but um, the expenses, right? So if they get into the actual assets of the hospital, um, it doesn't take very long to bring down a whole entire system. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So you, you did some some very fascinating research around all that. And, you know, the ease at which, you know, a big organization like that could be compromised in that way is is pretty shocking i bet but it makes sense because you know the people that are tending to this and that yeah. it, often those organizations are so disconnected right it's so yeah. specialized the specialist and that specialist with no real weaving together or holistic system yeah. model right it's more of this other model that leaves all these gaps and loopholes for people to get in and um, yes. and wreak havoc so wow fascinating combination of of skills and I know it's totally, uh, unrelated to the health and wellness piece but 
Um, there is a psychology behind, you know, the type of person that does that type of work and specifically in, in um, the healthcare space. So I made it work and I enjoy, um, I enjoy that part of my life too, but that is not um, my purpose and what I, what really uh -huh. likes, what I really enjoy doing and where I find myself being in service. So I've spent well over 15 plus years in the holistic um, space um, with my formalized education, but also with continuing education because I always want to be in the know of like, what's the latest, it's kind of where the trends are going. Um, but then also, how can I be different? Because I don't want to be just another massage therapist or just another yoga instructor or just another doula. I want to be different and stand out. And so in order to do that, I need to understand what that landscape looks like mm -hmm. so that I can brand myself differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what makes your services unique uh, as, as a practitioner? Yeah. So I think right now, honestly, you know, I tell my students all the time that um, I can teach you technique, but I can't teach you touch. You either have it or you don't. Mm. And so for me, I think early on, um, I have a Native American grandmother. So I think early on, those different um, ceremonies and, and the touch just the simple foot rubs or the scalp rubs, they felt very natural to mm -hmm. me. And, um, you know, that in combination with putting some formalized, this is the way you actually do the technique, felt very comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think what makes me different is now that I have a tool kit, a toolbox with multiple tools in it. And so, you know, where uh, there are therapists that only do massage or only do yoga or only do uh, energy work, that's great. And people say, well, you're all over the place. No, not really, because I customize the session. Mm -hmm. So the client that comes to me, I have enough information from several different pieces of the healing arts to support what I'd say nine out of 10 of those potential clients are going to need. Mm -hmm. There may be that one-off person that I'm, I'm like, I don't do that service. Mm -hmm. But that's few and far between for me. And so mm -hmm. I love that I have all of that information and knowledge and that I'm able to, even if I don't have to you know, put my hands on anyone um, in terms of the healing work, that I'm able to share information. Mm -hmm. And I know the different types of practitioners to say, well, maybe you need to go see this kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I can do that from the medical perspective or mm -hmm. I can do it from the holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, so you, you really are someone who's weaving together all of these different methods of care, all the mm -hmm. different ways that, that your clients or people in the community could get support with their health and, and healing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Because it really is for me about, you know, I don't care if everybody comes to me or not. There's someone, a practitioner for everyone. So if you have the information, you got to find the right practitioner for you. And mm -hmm. so if I'm that person, outstanding. But if I'm not, here's some other resources. I just want to be able to serve the community and meet the need wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I imagine that part of your discovery of holistic wellness practices was a personal journey um, that you may have had uh, some of your own growth or healing that that wasn't met in the medical field in some way. And I'd love to hear about that, that your exploration, what were some of the practitioners and healing modalities that helped you the most or practices that you've adopted as your self-healing practice? Yeah. So two very distinct things stand out for me. Um, from the perspective of mothering and the womb, um, I had uh, two large, very large fibroids that I had over 
just over seven years and I tried several different traditional Western medicine techniques as well as um, holistic techniques. And unfortunately for me and the type of fibroid that I had, they just were non-responsive mm-hmm. to um, the traditional methods. And with the alternatives, they responded a little bit, but not fast enough because unfortunately at the point of which I started engaging in all the alternatives, my body physically was at the point of you got to do something. It was a life or death situation. Oh, wow. So, um, the fibroids, uh, I had before I was pregnant and my, with my second child and my doctor told me, um, he said, if you're going to get pregnant, you need to do it on purpose and you're going to be a complicated pregnancy. And as soon as you deliver, um, you're going to have to have a hysterectomy. And so unfortunately the pregnancy, it was not planned. And so I found myself in a situation where the fibroids essentially outgrew, outpaced the growth of my baby and essentially suffocated. And so I ended up, that pregnancy ended up in a miscarriage. And so I lost the baby. Um, So that really, you know, put me on a different trajectory of um, understanding how um, strong this body is and all of the things it does uh, to protect us for a very long time before we get that boulder and it says, sit down somewhere, I'm done. And so there were little signs along the way that I just didn't pay attention to that now um, when my body says something or does something, um, I'm listening and I'm more in tune to that. So for me now I have a a strong meditation practice and I really do practice um, self-care. I'm very protective of the people I allow in my circle um, and I'm intentional about the work that I do um, and the the people that I'm around um, because energy is everything to me and so I want to make sure that I'm always putting myself in the most um, healthy situation as possible. and so I'm, I'm getting better. I'm not, I haven't perfected it, but it's certainly leaps and bounds better than it was, um, you know, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, my second uh, holistic, I guess, event would have been around my diet, nutrition. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, you know, part of the fibers was adjusting my diet. Mm-hmm. And I went vegan for about a year and noticed like tremendous changes in my body. And so I'm not vegan right now and I can tell the difference. Um, again, my body was so inflamed and there were a lot of different things physically happening to my body as a result of the diet. Mm-hmm. And very you know, quickly for me, I just stopped everything and I was strictly vegan mm-hmm. and that worked for me. Now, having said that, I'm back to my, I'm from the South, so I eat, but I also try to make sure that I'm um, exercising and doing other things that keep me well balanced. Um, And so I don't deprive myself of things, but I'm more mindful about the things that I eat Mm -hmm. and the things that I do. Beautiful. So um, I had a question around the first scenario that you were talking about. But now it's with the five rides, right? The first part of of what you were sharing about. Oh, yeah. It seems to me like um, that possibly both of these explorations with uh, listening to what your body is asking for sooner before it turns into a crisis, say, like Mm -hmm. the one that you had with the miscarriage and not being able to to, um, carry to, to term. Um, it seems like that that uh, that growing awareness in you corresponds with your shift from, like you said, uh, I mean, getting a PhD in something that wasn't really your life calling Mm -hmm. to now listening more deeply to what is your life calling? What are you passionate about? You know, what is that inner guidance telling you to create? which is very, it's very similar to, you know, what 
does our womb say? What does our body say? How are we needing to be nourished? What are we meant to be creating? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm curious to hear you share a little bit about that, how that, how you see that weaving together, your, your discovery and nurturing of your calling and passion alongside this discovery and nurturing of a, of a new way of being with your body and your health. Yeah. yeah. So you're absolutely right. The, the PhD and the discipline for which I obtained, while I was doing it, more than halfway through the program, I'm like, why are you doing this? But mm -hmm. I am also that person that once I started, I'm committed to it. Mm -hmm. um, I did see a benefit in it. And I do love that work. It just, it's not something that I saw being my forever and something I wanted to do every day and really being able to contribute back to society. It was a means for me to make money. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I can make dif a difference in that space too but that's not where my joy comes from. Mm -hmm. And so I started to you know, have some phys physical manifestations from the stress of that type of work mm -hmm. on my body um, that wasn't serving me. And so um, I finished my program and I'm very proud that I finished my program. And if I could do another program in the holistic disciplines, I certainly would, but I don't need to, to do that piece to do the work that I do mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, I should have been a nurse or a doctor over 20 years ago, but mm -hmm. that's not how my journey was meant to be. So right. I think now I'm very clear that, um, yes, I want to be an osteopath, but I, I'm a woman of a certain age. And so I don't want to spend another 10 years in school and, mm -hmm. and essentially stop the momentum I have in the work. Sure. That I yeah. So nursing works for me. Mm -hmm. I will do that, as I mentioned. And then um, the next step over that would be to be a practitioner um, or a midwife and still be able to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so you've seen as the shift is happening, at the same time, it sounds like there's this shift in your relationship with your health. Yes. And, and do you see that going hand in hand with a lot of your clients who are having big reorganizings of how they're looking at their purpose in life at the mm -hmm. same time that they're having a big reorganization of how they address their their health and their well-being yeah. what i've seen quite a bit you know honestly people don't have real conversations with themselves right mm -hmm. they wait for things to completely fall apart or get to a place with and, and they're in a crisis situation mm -hmm. um Sometimes when, I would say more often than not, by the time the client makes it to me and we're having that discussion, I'm asking some questions that I'm thinking they probably have already played in their head and they're looking at me like, well, that's a really good question. And I'm thinking, how have you been able to maintain this level of stress or dysfunction as long as you have? It's very right. one that your body hurts or that you know, you have signs and symptoms of other things going on. So mm -hmm. that's why I say the education piece for me is important. It's just a conversation. Mm -hmm. Whether I actually do anything with them or not, if I can get people to start to think and believe that there's more um, interaction that they need to have mm -hmm. with their body and their cells, there, there's an awareness that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. And we all walk around like <laughs> life is happening and we're not fully engaged. Mm -hmm. It's just happening. Right. You know, and that comes from, you know, a lot of how we're brought up and what we're taught, especially in public school, which is mm -hmm. there's this set of rules that you're supposed to live by that someone else has determined mm -hmm. and, and that you're just supposed to go along and play by the rules and stay out of trouble, right? And so, and, and so people just sort of fall into that. So, you know, a lot of people do just fall into that and don't think that there's any way out of it, even if, even though that set of rules is so unhealthy for us, mm -hmm. you know, just doing that is terribly unhealthy for human beings. The, the, the collective, you know, rule book, it, it does not consider especially women's bodies, 
And it doesn't yeah. really consider men's bodies either. I mean, men's health mm -hmm. issues are sometimes uh, more severe and, and debilitating than women's. Yes. And, um, and so part of that, getting free of that set of rules someone else made and getting in touch with how we actually want to live our lives mm -hmm. and take responsibility for that ourselves can be very scary because if you've leaned on this scaffolding yes in order to be safe and stay out of trouble you know and the whole <laughs> programming to keep you there is telling you you're going to be in terrible trouble or in terrible danger if you step out of that right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it needs a, a distrust in our own d inner guidance and teaches us to trust in what someone else some authority is telling mm -hmm. us right with some degree yeah. or some position of power and so uh finding our own inner location of our inner power and our inner responsibility and ability to listen to our own inner guidance seems really central to this learning process and it's not an easy thing as a practitioner to point someone to that without having them decide that we're the new authority right <laughs> have you ever run into that and i wonder how you deal with that yeah so it's funny that you say that um because i was recently just before christmas i was recently nominated top doc for integrated health and wellness in my area wow. and so I've, you know, but before that I've had clients or just in general, you know, talking to people, they said, oh, I heard you do X, Y, Z, or you have experience in such and such. And so I get certain questions um, from the perspective, almost it felt like I was a viable resource um, of information for them. And so, like I said, whether that turns into a client for me or not i'm about giving the information out because i want people to be well and live a full life um that's more about more than just about doing stuff um that really has no meaning at the end of the day mm -hmm. what do you want people to say about you and so me my ability to help them create those types of um long-term stories is important to me and so my word um, is inner fitness mm -hmm. is we look great on the outside when we put put this package together but a lot of us are still really messed up inside and so you can clean it all up but if you're still messy inside what good is, are you really of you know to the community and so we've got to do the work and get ourselves in order so that we look good on the inside and feel good on the inside mm -hmm. and that just naturally comes out on the outside so yeah i get those questions that say you know i i kind of feel like they think i'm a point of authority and that feels great which makes me you know have to stay up on my game too i gotta be in the research and in the know and understand like i said before where the trends are going mm -hmm. um, so that i'm giving um, the most accurate information i can Beautiful. And it sounds like you hold yourself as an informational resource. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to working with people that you're going to point them to their inner resources and just nourish those inner resources so that they have a freedom of what they're choosing still. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily telling them what they have to do, but you're uh, you're showing them what some of their options are that is makes a bigger playing field than they might have seen before yes, yes. yeah I, I find that to be really important to me because i've i've had the experience of yoga teachers for example or um healing practitioners that are even spiritual teachers that really get into that sense of authority and you say it does feel good when someone validates the work that you're bringing mm -hmm. so that that's a, that's a dangerous that can be a dangerous thing because if i'm just replacing the authority that someone was de dependent on before with you know what's the difference am i really serving my purpose right. of helping people to be liberated from that mm -hmm. system and find their inner locus of power right yeah. inner power i'm all about inner power mm -hmm. and so um it's it's a big question to i feel 
And so it sounds like this informational resource is a big, is a big part of steering clear of that and being mm -hmm. up to date with the information that's available. Awesome. Yes. Wonderful. So do you have a way for people to get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more about your work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so my website is www.sacredsoulwellness.org. Mm -hmm. um, you can follow me on Instagram at Sacred Soul Wellness um, or on Facebook at Dr. That's D R Tiffany Taft, the number one. And that's Dr. Tiffany Taft, the number one on Facebook. All right. Beautiful. Thank you so much once again. And I'll just, I'd like to end with holding a vision for. Um, for all of us finding that inner resource that's true to our purpose and to what mm -hmm. we're meant to be giving and serving, how we're meant to be serving um, yes. from that inner knowing, um, free of, of any uh, intense outer influences that might not be aligned with that and supported by community and uh, practitioners and resources that are aligned with that and that do nourish that and support that so um, holding that vision with you for you for me with me together so anything you would like to add about no. that in general? <laughs> thank you so much for that um, and like I said again it's all about education and and the more that you know we can share the knowledge that we have and mm -hmm embrace the community i think the better off we all will be we're all on the journey um, we don't have it perfected but we learn together and we do better together beautiful we do better together all right thank you so much and that's all for now here on the womb centered healing podcast until next time <laughs>